This is TomorrowPictures.tv. Welcome to the GPFF Lives Online Conversation. My name is Kelly Devine. I'm the Artistic Director. Please join me and Nina Strike, the Executive Director, as we have a conversation with activist and filmmaker Frederick Taylor. And don't forget to check out peacefilmfest.org so that you can keep track of all of the events leading up to the festival, which will begin September 20th through the 26th. And now let's talk to Frederick. Hey, how are you, Frederick? Hey guys, how are you guys today? We're it's really good. Great, to very, uh, great to see you. And, um, you know, uh, every time we talk to you, there's always so much going on and, but the one thing I wanted to say to kind of start off the conversation is one of the things I know Nina and I love about doing this festival for all these years are the relationships that we've been able to establish with, with people like yourself, uh, because you just bring, you, you bring so much, uh, you know, in, in terms of your work and in terms of your being. And so we're really thankful for the kinds of, of connections that the festival is, has allowed us to make. So that we can have these kinds of conversations and you know so um i had been i think it was on linkedin and i saw your j setting and i sent it straight off to nina and i said i know what our next glow is it's going to be with frederick yeah and, and I, I loved j setting yeah. as well <laughs> we're going <laughs> to share the link we're going to share the link at the end of this conversation so so anybody watching this can find it um but it's just a wonderful piece. Thank you. Um, it was a wonderful experience um, as, as well. Um, at a very um, challenging time, it was in the middle of the pandemic. And at that time during the pandemic, when we didn't always know exactly what was going on or what the information that we needed to protect ourselves was. But this was one of those things that was kind of coming down the pike. It was an opportunity that was going to be in that moment and it was, you know, leap or don't leap. It was sort of a risk management type of decision um, when it came to creating art in this particular case. It was through uh, KQED out of San Francisco, which is the PBS affiliate there. They have a show called If Cities Could Dance. They go around the country. Um, highlighting different uh, people and cultures and enclaves of, of individuals who enjoy the art of dance. This is a unique group of individuals uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and they do what is called J setting, um, which J setting is, um, it's a very interesting modification of uh, modern dance, hip hop, break dancing, um, HBCU sort of uh, majorette and step show. Um, but the big curveball in this is that it's gender fluid. And I had never seen anything when it involving street dance or urban dance that was immediately identifying itself as gender fluid. Generally, when we think of gender fluid, dance as expression, we are thinking more in the realm of like something more like classical dance or ballet or, you know, where you need both genders to move together in, in, in be synchronized. Um, but usually, you know, um, street dancing is um, very uh, hyper-masculine. And um, even for the women that do street dancing, it's still, very hyper-masculine. Um, but in this particular case, that's not it at all, all the way down to the fashion and things like that as well. And these young men are part of the LGBTQ community too. So they're enormously brave uh, as, as, as well, which ultimately to me, that was the real story here, bravery on, and, and courageousness on so many different levels. And then, of course, during COVID, that right. has a whole another layer of bravery. Absolutely. Um, without question. Like I said, we didn't know what we were doing. I mean, this was back when people were unfortunately passing in waves, you know, um, and 
we had an idea of how we should protect ourselves, but we weren't quite sure. And now we're asking some people to get out there and push their cardiovascular systems dancing with a mask on. You know, it's this crazy ask, you know, but they did it. And with a lot of uh, courage and commitment as, as well. So are you doing more with J setting or? or I'd like to, um, it, it's because... an incredible, my opinion is, is that it's an entire movement, you know, that it's, it's J setting and it's music, it's dance, it's style, it's culture, it's fashion, it's all of these things. It's alternative lifestyle, it's LGBTQ. Um, there hasn't been really a detonation point in gay culture, arguably since disco where there was something that was completely identifiable with the culture that was undeniable that everybody wanted to participate in. Um, that was one of the other aspects of this that really drew me into it. I mean, I'm thinking like, gosh, is Jay setting kind of like a modern disco kind of thing with more of an urban street feel to it? The answer to that question is probably. Uh, now the, the key is how do you take that to the next level? Um, this is not on the radar of the content creation industry on the commercial level, even into the art level. You know, it's just, it's literally fallen out of the sky. It's come out of nowhere because it was siloed in the gay community and specifically not just the gay community, the black male or African-American gay community uh, is, as well, which is, and they point this out in the video is a layer on a layer on a layer. You know, trans lives matter. I mean, there's just, there's a, you know, there's a specific discourse or diaspora specific to uh, African-American men who are gay that is different from just regular, not regular, but general market or white gay males. They live in many cases in two separate universes. And, um, in the African-American community, um, you know, we're still unpacking um, same sex orientation and relationships. And we're still very bogged down at times by the dogma of religious doctrine and things like that, that at times does feel very antiquated or archaic or dare I say it 20th century. You know, we are in the 21st century. Um, and, you know, gender, you know, gender identity or um, sort of orientation are personal matters. They're private matters. You wake up every day, you decide how you want to present. I wake up every day and I say, I'd like to go into society and present as a male. And then on my personal level, you know, I'm oriented towards women. But that's my personal business and it doesn't have anything to do with my ability to perform in life and i'm not shackled with that as a problem or that encumbers me from achieving as my best self but unfortunately we live in a society that if there is a particular individual who's oriented in a way that is viewed as aberrant sexually or even in presentation they are sort of categorically you know wiped away that's what makes this dance of expression and art extraordinary. It's undeniable. You can't do it. <laughs> you know, that's the guess. Right. Well, one of the things though that I wanted to connect with the, or that you had said earlier that really connected with me and and maybe put into words how I felt about watching Jay setting was when you mentioned the connection to disco, that it has a this harken. Uh, back to that, because what I think back about my encounter with disco in the in the seventies, and and now I see a connection with the way that I looked at at J setting, was that it's a celebration of life in the face of a denial of life. Completely, exactly. You know, and there are only certain times in our history as human beings where that occurs. We see it quite often in Latino culture and African-American culture and um, 
even Asian culture is, is, is well, it, it, and, and those are communities of people that come from more of an indigenous background and more of a, 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 a communal or village or tribal type of setting as well, where everything is a, is a celebration, good, bad, or indifferent. And the modes of expression aren't always verbal, they're physical. Right. And they're very emotional as well. And there's no stigma attached to it. You know, I, I, I try to get people to understand, like, when you grow up in a very ethnocentric environment, everyone must dance. There is no such thing as you can't dance, you know, because someone will come over and grab you, whether it's someone's grandmother or abuela or whatever. Oh, come on, you're going to you're going to go to the dance floor, you know, in more of white culture, specifically American white culture, people. Oh, I don't dance. Oh, I don't want to do that. I'm just, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're just stiff and they're just so rigid. And they just and, and this is really a metaphor for how they live their lives and the society that they live in and the rules and all of these constructs that keep them from experiencing everything. You've got to let it go. You have to free your heart. I think that's, I think those are words that we, you know, that everyone could, could take to heart is to, to let go. Um, right. and, and just moving, because I know you are always working on so many things. Nina had mentioned to me that you had reworked counter histories. And also been, let me jump in here for a, a second, yes. because um, we're also talking about counter histories is going to be shown uh, in the Nepal America, you've agreed to show it in the Nepal America International Film Festival that's actually taking place virtually this year because of the pandemic. Um, uh, but on Juneteenth is the actual screening date. So um, if you can talk about uh, how, you know, how you've reworked the film, which is how we met was when you submitted mm -hmm. Counter Histories Rock Hill to, uh, to be in our festival. And, and we were delighted to, to share it with our audiences and welcome you to Orlando to the festival. Thank you. Um, what has been discovered since we first met is that it's an evergreen film. And what has been discovered since we first met is that it's a universal film. It's a global film. It's something that anyone in any part of the world can relate to you know, as it pertains to being your best self and being able to be a participant and an active participant in the society with which you live. Um, and it's become something far more powerful than I had ever really anticipated because initially it's like, oh, it's a civil rights film, it's in America, it's about these guys living in the South in the 1960s, which for many of us who um, have had the opportunity to study black history, which is at times now being debated whether we should continue to move forward with that. But, but those of us that have had black history know that story. And one of the things that we do sometimes is silo it in as it's just an American story. It's not, it's a humanitarian story. That's why we must teach these things in school. It's essential to our survival as a species that we must know the trials and tribulations of all people, good and bad, you know, it's gonna make us better. And now I realize that this film makes people better and the audience for it isn't just in America, it's anywhere in the universe. You know, if aliens came down, they could probably watch it and say, hey, really relate to that. There's this thing on this planet that's on the other side of the Milky Way that kind of the same thing kind of happened. And let me tell you that story. That's who we are. That's how we evolve as organisms. We're always colliding and, and bouncing around with each other. And then we've got to figure out how to, you know, coalesce together. And that's what the, the, the film is really, um, is really about. And that speaks to everyone. And it doesn't even need to necessarily um, be in someone's mother tongue either. It, it seems to just translate visually uh, as, as well and within the realm of uh, metaphor. And I think it also handles the issues of violence in a dignified manner. You know, 
um, which is something that when the film was first made, I didn't think about on um, as a significant of a level. But now after, you know, the unfortunate um, murder and assassination of George Floyd and many other individuals, and then the storming of the Capitol and all of these horrible mass shootings that have happened just since we've changed administrations, this is relevant, you know. We need to learn how to deal with our violent side in a more higher thinking, holistic, third eye, fourth dimensional kind of way. You know, we, we, we need to regroup here in how we discuss uh, violence and spe specifically how we portray it in media. Agreed, agreed. Uh, in fact, uh, in the wake of January 6th, um, our GPFF newsletter had really touched on reminding, uh, reminding uh, our audience and anyone who might come across the newsletter that, that as a, an organization dedicated to peace, we wanted to, re we wanted to remind people that democracy is a form of peace. It's an important form of peace. That we don't all have to have um, the same exact views about tax policy or how to pick up the garbage, but we do have to agree to respect one another and to acknowledge one another's humanity and to find peaceful ways to work through those differences. And, and I think sometimes people lose sight of that. They think that democracy is this far off thing or it's just something you do every once in a while. Uh, you know, uh, at an elementary school uh, on a day in November, but it it is actually um, it is a, a distribution of power amongst us. So there are many responsibilities that come with it, as well as uh, as um, benefits, because it is a way of of dealing with um, the contestation of ideas and the contestation of identities. It's always a process. It's always in flux. We need to to go back to something you had said before. You know, we we need to take that to heart, and we need to see never lose sight of one another's humanity as we are going through that process. Exactly. And, and why, yeah. Because it's reflexive. I mean, me respecting your humanity enables my own. Right. And there's and that's what democracy does. It reminds us of that. And for some strange reason, now we have this disconnect that somehow we think that people should be put into these caste systems based on behavior. If you do not perform in a certain way or you do not act and walk and talk and think and believe in a certain way, then you have to be compartmentalized. And certainly if you are not being commoditized, you do not have the same level of value. If LeBron James is stopped by law enforcement, he will never be killed because he is an ecosystem. He is a commodity. But most people are not ecosystems and we're, most people are not commodities. They deserve dignity and value within society, no matter what level of society they're on. Even if you think maybe this guy was passing a bad $20 bill, that does not connote a, uh, death sentence, you know? And a lot of people say, oh, well, you know, these guys, these black guys wouldn't get killed if they just obeyed the law. What they don't understand, and I can say this as a black man, because I've experienced that, the law is not there. There is no law there, it's lawless. You can't try to obey the law. And George Floyd's last cries were being contrite. Like, just let me go, let me go. Yeah, I'm not gonna do anything to you. And that didn't matter because he wasn't the type of person that could be commoditized. So he can be gotten rid of. And we, through this colonialist history throughout the ages, we have gotten rid of people of color, indigenous people, women or people that we view as aberrant or alternative when we think we don't have any purpose for them. It happens all the time, you know, it happens every day. 
you know, in microaggressions all the way up to the ultimate aggression, which is extinguishing a life, whether that's uh, a man on the side of the road with law enforcement or someone walks into a massage parlor and assassinates women, you know, and to go numb with that and not be able to connect is a problem. And that's what counter histories is about. The metaphor is the counter, they walk in the diner, all that other stuff. That's all nice, but that is metaphor now because it doesn't exist that way anymore. I can walk in any restaurant in America and order whatever the hell I want. But there was a time when I couldn't. So now that mythology has become metaphor that you can apply to all of these other circumstances in life as far as what is the counter, you know? And at times the counter is law enforcement. Sometimes the counter is I'm just working on my job here and I don't really mention someone coming in shooting me or I'm wor worshiping at the, you know, my place of worship and I don't want someone to come in and injure me either. Or I'm at school or my kids are at school or I'm in a nightclub in Orlando. You know, it just goes, we know these things. It goes on and on and on. Right. You know, it's the same thing. Well, then that, that brings, one of the things that we value at the center of our work at Global Peace Film Festival is providing models for people to bring peace into their own lives. And, you know, and that's certainly why we were attracted to your work. And, you know, so if in, in kind of, you know, closing, if you could kind of talk to our audience about the kind of models um, for moving forward and let us know also what's, you know, what are you working on next and how can our audience support you? The, uh, the, the, the models is sort of um, not getting outside of the box, it's blowing the box up. The box is over. The box is 20th century. We are in the 21st century or in the 21st year of the 21st century. And for those of us that are old enough, that's remarkable. <laughs> you know, that's kind of science fiction, Stanley Kubrick kind of stuff. <laughs> and we need to approach it from that particular aspect that we are living in a whole new world order. All bets are off. We need to find new ways of expressing ourselves and demonstrating what it's going to take for us to survive. So it's new stories. It's new people. It's new heroes. You know, it's new. It's it's new timelines that are far more inclusive that involve women in leadership positions getting this idea of who you go to bed with off the table. It's not relevant. No one's behavior is determined based on who they kiss goodnight before they turn out the lights. It's literally none of our business. And how someone decides to present or dress themselves when they go out in the world, none of our business. That's their choice, you know? And we need to stop putting people within these boundaries and these parameters. And for such a long time, content, art, culture has been doing it, portraying, you know, perpetuating the hyper masculine -ish image and the hyper feminine image. And then, you know, you know, the, the gay image is just, you know, turned into a cartoon, you know, black men and Latino men are hyper masculine and then Asian men aren't at all and Asian women are completely and totally objectified and black women and Latino women are like angry and like we just keep doing this. It's not, it's not real. They're all lies. They're all, I don't even know those people that they present in media. I roll my eyes when I'm watching Netflix. I'm like, really, this is a thing. And then it's a conflict and someone pulls out a gun. Right. You know what I mean? I'm gonna say this, every conflict ends with a gun. Just You can get a counter. Watch Netflix and count every single time there's a conflict and someone pulls out a gun to resolve a conflict. It's insane. If you don't think that burns into your psyche, you're crazy. If you don't think that doesn't influence young people, you're nuts. If it doesn't make us older people depressed, absolutely. It creates a sense of hopelessness and then they show you an advertisement for a, a drug that has side effects that'll make you feel better. And then they say, go to McDonald's buy a soda, you know, it's real. We, we live in this very bizarre Orwellian matrix and moving forward, 
we need to get out of it. And each artist needs to really say, hey, am I doing something to blow this box up? That's my, um, that's my take on, uh, on, on that. So currently I'm doing a project that's called Where is America? It's, I'm producing music now with the music artist and I'm creating Music Story. Music Story is a song that's a part of or parallel to another linear story. In this particular case, it's documentary imagery along with this particular piece of music that's scored around this particular song as well. And it's, this, it's just a 10 minute discussion about like, where is the country that we had all hoped for? Where is um, America, you know? And can we find our way back to something that is really hopeful and meaningful for all of us, you know? I mean, I feel differently about the flag now than I did a year ago, two years ago, since 2016. It doesn't evoke the same feelings. I'm not saying it's bad, but it doesn't feel too good either. Right, right. And um, I'm unpacking that, you know, that's one of the boxes that I'm really trying to blow up in moving forward. And that's what that project is, is, is well. Well, and you'll keep in touch with us, yes? Of, of, of course. Um, you'll want to see this one. This one's even wackier. So it's getting... Oh, well, we can't wait. <laughs> and look forward to continuing to share, uh, to share your work with us. So thank you, Frederick Taylor. Um, My pleasure. Uh, and Kelly, do you want to talk us sure. out? So, so please... Uh, Thank everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for for listening through to this conversation. Please check out J Setting on YouTube and watch Counter Histories Rock Hill on Indie Flicks. And again, uh, go to peacefilmfest.org to keep track of all of the announcements related to the upcoming September twentieth through twenty sixth in person uh, events. But we will also have. Uh, plenty of conversation and films available online for all of our friends who can't make it down to Orlando. And, and thank you so much. Don't change that station while we pause for a brief commercial break. This is TomorrowPictures.tv.